conditional probabilities, depending on the strategic choices of each of the teams. Uh, so given that we have this information, we have argued that it may be difficult to get it, but let's assume we have it, okay? What can we use it for? Um, let's look at an example here. Here is some um, probabilities, which we can kind of take for, for given now. 0 0.8 that team 1 t beats teams 2 if they both choose an offensive strategy. Of course, a smaller probability, 0 0.1. So it seems that team 1 is much better than team 2 here at least, okay? Uh, a big uh, draw probability if... So here I also have kind of put up the draw probability, adding these two together and taking 1 minus the sum produces these draw probabilities. Now what we can do now, given a choice or point score system, is to compute the expected payoffs. Okay, so let's see how we do that. It's uh, straightforward, as long as we know how to do it. So. Uh, Based on this example, these probabilities here, you don't need to think about them at all. They're just kind of picked so more or less at random, okay? Um, then we can compute these expected point scores. So, if T1 chooses O and T2, T2 chooses O, then we have this probability 1, 2 equal to 0 0.8, P21 equals to 0 0.1, and PD then equals to 0 0.1. The sum then turns out to be 1, that it should be. Okay, so each of these lines here should sum to 1. This doesn't sum to 1, does it? Oh yes, it does. This sums to 1? Yeah, it seems correct. Okay. So. Um, in order to calculate expected point score based on a point score system, okay? We should call it point system. So we need to have a certain point system, okay? So in this case, let's assume that this one is this one, okay? Then we can, uh, then we can calculate expected point score, we often write it like this, an E, and the thing we want to find the expected value of, and a parenthesis, and in this case is for team 1, given that both teams chooses an O strategy. And that information brings us to, to these probabilities. And of course the probability that team 1 wins the match and achieves three points is 0 0.8, isn't it? They can also get a draw point here, a single point for a draw, and probability of a draw is 0 0.1. They can of course also get zero points, but that doesn't count, okay? So uh, to be really correct, it should be like this, okay? But this one we typically omit. 3 times 0 0.8 is 2.4, plus 1 times 0 0.1 is 0 0.1, that is 2.5, okay? So that is this, how we calculate this number. Similar strategy if you want to calculate this number, so let's do that as well. Let's calculate the expected value for the, for the second team. given that both teams still use the OO strategy. Then there is a probability of 0 0.1 that team 2 wins. Okay, so it's 3 times 0 0.1. This one is the same. The draw probability doesn't change in between them. So this is 0 0.4, isn't it? 0 0.3 plus 0 0.1 is 0 0.4. So that explains this value. Of course, all these values can be ca calculated based on the same principle. Exactly the same. The neat thing now is that we actually have a game, don't we? Because now, based on possible combinations of strategies for each of the players, we have payoffs expected for player 1 and expected payoffs for player 2. This should be below the diagonal, this should be on top of the diagonal. Okay, so we can 
convert this information easily into our game table. And here we have done that. Okay, you need just to keep your tongue straight here when you do this. So in the OO case, of course, the two numbers were 2.5, 0 0.4, which we recognize here. And the other numbers are, of course, correctly placed based on this previous table. Of course, now we can start handling this in the normal fashion. Finding best replies, finding Nash equilibrium, see what happens, okay? Yeah, I don't know whether I do that here, yes. Yeah, if you do it here, you see, perhaps you can see that immediately that 2.5 is bigger than 1.4, so there's a circle around this one. 2.3 is bigger than 1.2, so there's a circle around this one. We want as high expected point score as possible. 0 0.4 is bigger than 0 0.35, so there is a square here. And there is a square there, meaning that this Nash equilibrium is the only one of this game. As we can see down here, this part produces the Nash equilibrium. Now I'll do a little funny thing down here. Um, now if you look at the points here, you see that one of these teams is much better than the other, don't you? Because one team gets 2.5. That's more or less the level Molde has been this season. The other gets 0 0.4, which is fairly low. Okay, so this is a very good team against a very, very bad team. Of course, we can repeat these calculations, can't we? For these numbers and putting in a different point score scheme. No problem about that. We just repeat it. The only thing we do is that we substitute all these trees with two. Do the same, we get another game. Okay? If you do that, then uh, of course we end up with different payoffs here. Here's everything is done more or less. Uh, and then we end up with this matrix. So uh, 1.7 is bigger than 1.1, so we get the circle here. 165 is bigger than 1, so we get the circle here. 0 0.35 is slightly bigger than, so we get a square here. These are equal, so we get two squares, but they don't really interfere with the Nash equilibrium. So what we see now is that the Nash equilibrium changes, don't we? In the previous case, it was here. Both teams played offensively. In this, or choose, chose the O strategy. But in this case, we get a change. So by moving from a 3.1 system into a 2.1 system, we can actually expect, based on this simple example, that the team strategies may change. That's kind of obvious, isn't it? If you get more paid for a victory, you would have a higher tendency to play a different way. So if the relative value of getting a draw increases, as it does with the old system, then you should expect, perhaps, that there may be strategic changes. And that was the whole idea of introducing this 3-1-0 system, wasn't it? To make the teams play differently. And we kind of demonstrate this here now by this simple example that that is possible to achieve. But it depends on the numbers here, doesn't it? So not maybe not all teams choose making things differently. So to some extent, if you interpret these O and D as offensive and, and the defensive, there is a one team playing defensively here, the other offensively. In this, under the new regime, both teams play off offensively, if that's what you want. Okay. <coughs> This is kind of just uh, a starting point, okay? Now we'll try to apply this modeling scheme into some, should we say, real-world examples, okay? So in 327, a more realistic and interesting example. Uh, we look at Norway versus Brazil. So now we look at a single game, and what we're interested in now is to try to construct these probabilities in a manner which seemed reasonable 15 years ago. Okay, that's our target. And at that point, Norway was a very good team. They were typically among the four or five best on the FIFA rank. Brazil was, of course, still a good team, also among the four or five best on the FIFA ranks. But uh, Norway and Brazil played very differently at that point, much more, much greater difference than today. 
because this was in the days of the the first period of Egil Olsen and um, at that time Norway was extremely strict uh, linked to this way of playing which we discussed briefly previously in this course with this breakdown system and uh, long ball when you had the ball yourself and as we also discussed the key to make such a system sensible is that the other team does not adopt countermeasures and if there is any team in the world that would very reluctantly start playing ugly as the Brazilians would say that would be Brazil so you should expect in a sense that in that time time period Norway actually should perform better than Brazil and as the history shows among the four matches played Norway has won two and two has ended with the draw which of course is a very strong record as far as I know Brazil Norway is the only team Brazil hasn't won against which they have played against and that's kind of nice isn't it nice for Norway at least <laughs> maybe not that nice for Brazil sooner or later we'll probably meet Brazil again and then we will probably lose so uh, the record will be beaten but uh, you never know okay so the key to this is to kind of construct these probabilities here I have constructed some probabilities and now suddenly we have changed these O and D into N and B and the meaning here is as follows okay N is the normal strategy for Norway which kind of corresponds with the way they played back 15 years ago meaning that they were trying to win the ball as close to the opponent's goal as possible and if they kind of started with the ball at home close to their own keeper they just kicked it away okay that's maybe a bit ugly to say but it's kind of very close to what they actually did in those days the, the, the flow pass was made of course meaning that the, the left back got the ball from the keeper and just put it as far as he could on the diagonal on the other diagonal and this is kind of the re the, the the a very strong example on this way of play but uh, the point here is these numbers let's have a look at them okay let's look uh, uh, and again b then means the normal way of playing for brazil short passes having fun with the ball going slowly then suddenly exploding okay that that's the kind of way brazil played those days more or less uh, much the same they play these days so they they use a lot of short passes starting from the keeper playing a lot sideways on the midfield and then suddenly they attack of course this is a risky period when you are kind of building up for this attack because if Norway gets the ball then, then the distance to the to the opponent's goal is fairly short and given that you have uh, enough power of running you can utilize these to to get the goal but if you look at the numbers here uh, and there's another strategy I haven't explained is this A strategy so in the first line here Norway plays like Norway Brazil plays like Brazil okay, in the second line there is an A for Norway instead Brazil still plays like Brazil A then is some kind of alternative strategy okay and for Norway's case in, in this example you might think of that as uh, playing more possession like okay not using this normal strategy maybe playing more passes and that kind of thing in those days Norway, Norway couldn't do that okay so that would perhaps uh, lead to problems for Brazil the A here could mean a more mimicking like strategy a strategy which is kind of closer to the way Norway play kind of a more uh, uh, more uh, breakthrough kind of way of playing so you see here if both teams do something they don't really know how to master then we assume kind of a maximal variance distribution everything can happen okay there is a, an equal probability of any kind of outcome here given that and that that is of course something you can question but it um, it has been implemented here if Norway plays its best and Brazil plays its best then we have given slightly more probability to Norway than to Brazil we can think about this as a home game for Norway and in those days that is perhaps not a bad assumption especially based on the track record so we assume here that Norway is slightly better than Brazil if Norway plays as they normally do and Brazil plays as they normally do and as I said the record kind of indicates that in the second line here Norway chooses a different strategy of course then 
something happens here. What we do here is we take some probability from Norway's 0 0.5 and move it in that direction. We also take a little moving in that direction. So if Norway plays differently, there's a slight increase in the draw probability, but there's a relatively big decrease in Norway's probability of winning. At the same time, Brazil's probability of winning increases. We could, of course, argue that these numbers should be smaller and these numbers should be even bigger. Okay, but again, think about the setting and the time period we look at this into. And then finally, if Norway plays like Norway and Brazil plays, plays like Norway here, actually, it's a, sorry, Norway has this A as an alternative strategy, Brazil has this N as an alternative strategy, and we can think about it as playing like Norway. So if Brazil plays like Norway here, they, then balls are flying. The draw probability is, of course, increasing if both teams kind of move like that, but we have still kept an advantage for Norway in this situation. In case you really should criticize these probabilities, this is the one to criticize. You could perhaps swift, swift them around, saying that in that case, if Brazil plays like Norway, throwing long balls, then Brazilians are better individuals, so they, they are maybe better to take down the ball and, and shoot it in the goal if there is a long ball. On the other hand, Brazil has very little practice on that. So that could be an alternative way of kind of explaining why we have put into this, why we have kind of argued behind these probabilities. The point is here is really not to argue whether these probabilities are right or not. They are a representation of a football match, actually. So if you look at this table, it's a different way of looking at a football match, isn't it? It's very much more boring than looking at the match itself, but it is a, a different representation. Very simplified, but it gives some indications. Of course, there is some grave assumptions here that these strategies, N, B, A, and N, are started at the match and are not changed, no matter what happens. That is a grave simplification. Apart from that, it, uh, it seems like a reasonable way of, of kind of converting the game theoretic content of a football match into this kind of information. Okay, given this information, we just repeat what we did previously and calculate expected point scores. Okay, if we do that, of course, then we can move into another table. There is some discussion in the textbook here on, on the arguments behind, and they are these probably, probably reasonably good arguments, I think. But uh, in the end, we end up with this. Okay, you see here from the numbers that uh, the preferred strategies indicates that Norway is a slightly better team than Brazil. They get on average 1.6 points, while Brazil get 1.3 po 1 points. Again, remember 15 years ago. Okay, today these numbers would be fairly different. So, given that we have these numbers, again we use our game theoretical skills and look for Nash equilibrium. Okay, that's straightforward here. 1.6 is bigger than 1.1, there's a circle there. 1.6 is bigger than 133, there's a circle there. 1.3 is bigger than 1.0, there's a square there. 1.7 is bigger than 1.33, so there's a square there. So we end up in the top corner here, where each team played, plays their preferred strategy. Okay, this kind of resembles the games we have seen between Norway and Brazil. Norway has played like Norway, and Brazil has played like Brazil. This is not a sensational conclusion, is it? Not at all. This is kind of what we would expect. But the next point is perhaps more interesting. Okay, so now we, we put Norway up against another team. It could be any team. The idea is that it should be a fairly less quality team than Brazil. In the textbook, we have chosen, chosen Belarus. Okay, I don't know the situation today. Probably Belarus is much better than Norway on the FIFA rank. Do you know? A little bit, perhaps? Yeah, we can always find a team below Norway on the FIFA rank, even today, can't we? Malta, for instance, are below. So let's uh, think about Malta, OK? So again, of course, know what we do when we look at a different match. We have to redesign this table to put different numbers in here. And of course, then we get different numbers in there. And then we get a new game. So uh, now we can kind of think strictly, I think, on this N strategy as a mimicking strategy. It's a strategy where this other team playing Norway plays exactly like Norway do. 
and uh, if you look at the Belarusian numbers um, they shouldn't be too controversial I think or if we like to call them Malta it doesn't really matter you see what has happened here is that we have changed the top line okay we made Norway a better team relative okay that seems reasonable if this were Malta maybe there was an 80% chance that Norway would win at home let's say it is a home match and there's a 10% that the Malta will win and 10% for a draw that is not very controversial again if both these teams play something they don't know then we kind of have a anything can happen structure. so we haven't changed that one this one is also unchanged I seem to remember I think it was 0 4 0 2 and 0 4 in the previous so the, the last two lines here it didn't haven't bothered to change at all the second line is slightly changed and in this case we have kind of made it we have given some more probability to Belarus, so in this case the, te the, the teams are actually equally good. So if Norway plays something they don't know how to do, then, and Malta plays as normal, then, uh, then the teams are equally good. Okay, you, can, you can always fiddle around with this. But you see the point, okay? we, we kind of look at two distinctly different matches. One team on the middle playing a good team, and then playing a bad team. Okay, what would be kind of the strategic choices for these teams, depending on how we kind of interpret the probabilities. Now, again, of course, the, the game theory is straightforward. We just calculate the two final columns here by uh, calculating expected payoffs. And, uh, of course, these two become equal due to these two equal. Then they must be the same. These two become equal as previously and uh, we end up with these matrix okay again game 3 is straightforward 2.5 is bigger than 145 1.6 is bigger than 133 1.0 is bigger than 0 0.4 and 145 is bigger than 133 but you see what's happening here is that the original Nash equilibrium here has now moved into this corner okay so what happens in this corner now Norway plays as, as they normally do their best strategy while Malta or Belarus or whoever it is they try a mimicking strategy here okay <coughs> now the idea here is perhaps to try to explain uh, we will return to this later on ah what happened it was previously wasn't it we saw that already didn't we yeah, it was in chapter 2. <coughs> now, where was it? Where is our friend through the Grudos? Yeah, here it is, okay. So if Morocco can be considered to be the other team here, which at that point in 98 was behind Norway, and had no history of playing like Norway, you can see from this analysis we did here that you kind of should expect that these bad teams should um, have a higher tendency to play differently. For instance, use the long ball, just like no one. It, if, if, you, if, if you are so lucky or so interested that you can find a tape of this match from the World Championships in France in 98 between Norway and Morocco, you can probably observe that that was actually what happened. It ended in a draw, 2-2 two -two and uh, Morocco, they played like Norway, as Grudo says here, so it's kind of surprising to them, it seemed. But our knowledge of game theory makes this no surprise for us, does it? This is kind of what you should expect. And this is kind of interesting, because it tells us a very fascinating story about the robustness of the Norwegian strategy. Because it tells us that if Norway plays good teams, then they have a good chance. And the better the teams they play, the better chance they have they play bad teams they had a much less good chance okay because the bad teams they are more eager to mimic the Norwegian strategy to avoid being killed by the Norwegian force do you see my point this can explain a lot of what we saw in those in those days for instance we, we saw a tendency that Norway played better away than home of course these bad teams tendency to adopt a countermeasure type of strategy, it could be mimicking, it could be any other kind of strategy, it would be increasing when they were playing in Norway, as opposed to playing at home. 
So it will be actually easier for Norway to beat this bad team away than at home. So you should expect a much better point record away than at home. We have perhaps seen the same on the Molde team this season in Tipoli, although the, the, the explanation is different. Uh, because Norway, Molde has played very good away in this season. Of course, the reason is that they have seems to have found a very good uh, and solid defensive strategy when they play away. Although it didn't kind of work as it should against Strömskutze. Of course, the reason was that some of the central parts of the team were not playing. Of course, that is, uh, that is important in those senses. The, the central line was kind of taken out and put in by other players. Of course, in that case, it uh, becomes more tricky. But that's kind of interesting, isn't it? That uh, you should expect that the kind of special strategy that Norway applied in those days with the characteristics it really had, you should expect that Norway should perform better away than at home, based on the analysis we have made. Okay? And of course, if you look back on the, the track record, you will see that that was exactly what happened. Norway played better away than at home in those days. They were struggling much harder to beat Belarus at home than in Minsk. Because in those days, Norway played, played better, Belarus a lot, and that's perhaps the reason why it's was used as an example here. No, no, it's uh, many years since we played Belarus, as far as I can remember. Okay, that was uh, the main point. Uh, let's um, think a little bit more about this. Um, so, of course, the main conclusion is that bad teams will easier kind of mimic the Norwegian type of strategy or implement the countermeasure type of strategy than the good teams. So you should expect that. Norway performs better against good teams. In those days, as you probably remember, Norway beat uh, Brazil, they beat uh, Argentina, they beat the Netherlands in the qualifying one time and drew, drew away, and they beat England at home and drew away in the 94 qualification, which of course today is kind of impossible to, to think about. Even though Iceland beat Netherlands the other, the other day, so uh, it's still possible, it seems. Now, if you look back on the numbers here, and we have to move down here. Okay, there is an interesting fact which kind of com pops up out of this. Um, mm, mm, mm. This is Norway, Brazil. We have to move into Norway and Belarus. Okay. Now let's try to think about Norway's preferred strategy. Okay. It produces 2.5 on average, which is a very high strategy compared to 0 0.4. So what happens with Norway though, if they improve this, their own strategy? If they become better to play their preferred strategy, what will happen with the numbers here then, do you think? Of course, this number will increase, won't it? We had a probability of 0 0.8, which we multiplied with this 3 point. That is the main part of this 2.5, isn't it? It's 2.4 out of this 2.5. So if they get better, this number here will increase, won't it? Let's say up to 0 0.9 or something. In that case, there is 2.7. You suddenly move into 2.8 as a total here. But what will happen with this number then? It goes down, doesn't it? becomes even smaller. And what's interesting game theoretically, here is the distance between this number and this number, actually. So the better Norway gets, the more strongly the opponent will choose this strategy. So it's not the help for Norway to become better in their own playing, is it? It's actually worse. You get less out of it. Of course, then the next idea is it should be better for Norway not to play at their best. And that's, that's kind of the fact, actually, here. Because you can reduce these numbers so much that this number becomes bigger than that one, can't you? And you can still end up with more than 1.6 as you get in this Nash equilibrium. It's just a num matter of doing the numbers. Okay, You can check it yourself. There is an example on how to do this in the textbook. The point is, you see that this, this really happens. Okay, And this gives us some explanations, doesn't it? It tells us that, for instance, it tells us why all these coaches always are talking their team down. Okay, You have heard that, haven't you? Every time there's a big match, there's these players injured, that player's injured, we have been stopped in, in customs, whatever, okay? Everything is bad. 
And the reason why it's interesting that everything is bad here is to try to tell the other team that everything is bad. So instead of using a counter message strategy, you try to hope to fool them to choose their preferred strategy, at least at the beginning of the game. Then, of course, you know that you're better, so then you will beat them. So there is a strong logic behind all this talk from these coaches that we hear every day. Okay? It's, a, it's a kind of very strong game theory logic behind it, uh, which of course opposes this other type of logic, which is related to providing confidence, saltelite innovation. Okay? We, we, we need to have confidence. Of course, telling the team that the best player is injured doesn't give confidence, does it? There are two forces here, okay, the confidence force and the game force, so to speak. But it seems in the practice that the game force is stronger. So you'd really like to talk down your team to try to come in a situation which is more like the Brazil situation. Okay. You would like to take this number down so much that this number increases so much that it's bigger than that one. And then your, your opponent team happily goes out at your home field playing like they always do instead of trying to do something else. And that's interesting, isn't it? It could be favorable for a team not to play as good as they could. And then we kind of move into uh, more complex matters, okay? Because when these coaches talk about injuries, many cases we see that these injured players apply on the, come up on the field, don't we? When the game, there's always these rumors in these big tournaments that now oh, this player is injured and that, and then suddenly they can't play. They don't seem injured at all. Okay, so there's a possibility of doing this simulated or real. Okay, of course, simulating should have the same effect if the opponent believes it. On the other hand, if the opponent has seen that these so called injured players pops up all the time, then he won't believe it anymore. So then you really have to do it. Then you have to break the leg of your best player, okay? That's kind of maybe a strong uh, assumption, but you don't have to, to include him in the team. So now we're moving into the situation where you would actually try to degrade your own quality to achieve a better result. Uh, it's kind of logical, isn't it? If that degradation can lead to a different tactical choice from your opponent that gives you necessary benefits, then it may be worthwhile. And that's kind of what we see in this type of analysis. But we can take it even a step further, okay? In the old days, before you were born, in many world championship tournaments in football, many of the favorite teams started out by losing their first match. We have examples from West Germany, Argentina, and Ita Italy at least, many times. The best way of signaling that you're not as good in your preferred play as your opponent would expect you to be is to lose the first match, isn't it? Then you really achieve this. Then you really achieve to take value from here, put it up here, so much that it... So, and you know in these tournaments you play three matches, don't you? And if you lose the first one and win the two next, then you're more or less certain to advance, aren't you? So this kind of be an interesting strategy. Oh, here you can open the World Championship as a favorite, and you lose the first match against some kind of silly team, Tunisia or Belarus or whatever. If you win the two next, then you are to the next round. And at the same time, of course, you have spread some feelings among all the competitors of the tournament that there is something wrong with Je West Germany or Germany or France or whatever this year. They are not as good as we thought. So we may in introduce another strategy. You may play like we, the way we are best at, instead of trying to only defend. So, there are kind of different stages here. If we have these coaches talking about being not as good, then you can try to fool by saying that there is a lot of problems and so on and so on, and, and then you can actually even do it, okay? You can choose to lose a match, and it turns out to be advantageous. This is the problem with these tournaments, okay? If there had been more matches in the tournament than only three, then this strategy wouldn't work. So that kind of brings us into the next chapter, which I think we should uh, leave for the next time, where we look at the regulation parts here.
it's very important how these tournaments, how these point score systems actually are. Okay? They, have, they may have a grave impact on what happens. Even small changes may lead to distos disastrous outcomes. So uh, let us uh, let us leave that for the next time. There is, if you move uh, a little bit along, there is an example here where you actually calculate what is necessary here. You see, we kind of reduce with some epsilon here. Then we get minus 3 times this epsilon in quality, and then we get plus 3 here. And of course, as long as epsilon is possible, this 1 plus something becomes bigger than 1. So we, we flash the Nash equilibrium. And you see, as long as epsilon is relatively small here, we get something close to 1.9 here, which is more valuable than getting 1.6 here. Okay, So this is kind of the, the story. It's, it's possible to do this mathematically. So you can guarantee that... Uh, the other guy flips the Nash equilibrium, moving from that point into that point, and at the same time, you still get more than you had previously. That's kind of so you have it's an advantage for you to get worse, so to speak. So you see, football is complex. Okay, it's not just about uh, doing your best. Sometimes it's even not that. Sometimes it's, it's really not about doing your best, and that makes it interesting, isn't, doesn't it? So. What about Molde against Odd? Should they win that match or should they lose it? What do you think? Maybe they should lose it. Because then they tell Odd that we are not so good, we are in a very big down period, we cannot get up. Okay, so, so Odd will go down to the cup final then with uh, a great uh, confidence, we will win, and suddenly Molde is a different team. That could be a good strategy, like in the line of this type of strategy. Okay? And of course, especially and these points have no value for Molde. Okay. These three points have no value. But there is a problem with this strategy, isn't it? The home audience, do they, would they expect this? Would they like this? Uh, it depends on whether Molde are able to make it credible through Vardy. If they are able to play the match in such a way that the audience feels that they have done their best. Do you think that's possible? Yeah, that's possible, isn't it? We have seen a lot of match-fixing cases where teams have seemed to do their best, but it turns out they have been well paid not to do it. Okay. In this case, you don't need to be well paid to do it. The system itself makes it interesting. So it's really interesting to see what will happen now. On. My guess is that Espen Uge Petersen will be the goalkeeper. He needs that match to get the gold medal, so that's kind of obvious. But then the question is whether Vega Forum will play or not. I believe he will not. So let's see. On Sunday, we get the answer. But uh, that kind of brings a different flavor into this match, doesn't it? This way of thinking. That's the idea here. Okay. Then we're finished for today. Meet again next Monday. And then we move into the next chapter in the textbook, which is chapter 4, I think. And it's called Regulation. Then we are closing up for the end here. Because chapter 5 is not a part of the curriculum. Pansum. Chapter 6 is a very small ending chapter, so we, we will definitely finish perhaps the lectures uh, by Monday, I think. And then the rest of the time will be used on going through these uh, previous exam exercises. Okay, have a nice day.